Hey friends, welcome back to Homestead on a Prayer. My name's Jennifer. I'm gardening here in Connecticut on about two acres of land. I'm in zone six. Today I want to give you a tour of my vegetable garden. So first we're going to go tour this main vegetable garden here, and then we'll head over to the new garden expansion that I just put in this spring. So let's head in and take a look. So I think the star of the garden right now is these beautiful snap peas. We actually haven't harvested any snap peas yet, but as you can see, they're in full flower and we're starting to get a few pea pods appear. So you can see my garlic patch here. The garlic is still looking really nice. But you can see it is starting to have a little bit of a weathered look to it. A lot of these leaves are starting to get these little brown tips on the leaves. That is actually a good thing. That's the sign that the garlic leaves are starting to send their energy down into the garlic bulb. And when they store up their energy in the garlic bulb, that's going to make a big, beautiful garlic head for us. Now, the other thing that you'll notice about this garlic is that we are starting to get garlic scapes. That is really exciting. Garlic scapes are one of those really special harvests that you pretty much only get if you grow garlic. You might be able to find some garlic scapes at a local farmer's market, or if you have a local grocery store that stocks seasonal local items, you might also be able to find them. But the season for garlic scapes is so short that really your best chance of finding them is if you grow garlic yourself. And bonus, garlic is really easy to grow. It gives you two harvests if you grow the hard neck variety. You get the scape and then you also get the bulb. Soft neck garlic won't give you the scape, but you still do get the delicious garlic bulb. So some of these garlic scapes are starting to curl around. Once they complete their first circle, which actually a few of these have, that means that it's time for me to harvest them and make all kinds of delicious garlic scape goodies. So I do usually make a fresh garlic scape pesto, which is really good and delicious, especially if you spread it on a homemade sourdough bread or something like that. I also, sometimes I'll just take some of the garlic scapes and saute them up with some butter, salt, pepper. It's really good that way, just as a simple side dish. I also do like to dehydrate some of them and then turn them into a garlic scape powder, which is also really good. If you have any other garlic scape recipes that you really love, I would definitely love it if you would share those with me. I am considering trying something new this year, maybe a garlic scape compound butter or something along those lines. So if you have any recipes for that or anything similar, I would definitely love to hear them. So I'm really excited about how this broccoli's coming. You can see the plants are huge. I pulled back the netting so that you guys can see them a little more clearly. So as you can see, my broccolis are starting to get their broccoli heads. That is really exciting. So this one still has a ways to go, but it's shaping up to be a really good broccoli head. If we look here through the other plants, you can see a lot of them are getting those little broccoli heads too. Back there, there's another one. So when I look down into the center of the broccoli plant and I see the first little sign of that little broccoli head starting to form, that is my cue that it is time to fertilize the broccoli. So actually yesterday, I did come out to the broccoli patch and I gave them some diluted fish emulsion fertilizer. And that, because it's a liquid fertilizer, that's like a quick release fertilizer. So that's going to give the broccoli an instant shot of nutrients. And it can use that to make the head as big as possible. Broccoli is a little bit of a challenging crop to grow, so I definitely want to make the most of the garden space that I'm giving this broccoli and make sure that it gives me the biggest head possible. Now once you harvest the main head of broccoli, you want to know which variety of broccoli you're growing because some broccoli varieties will give you side shoots, basically little mini heads, not as big as the main head, but over the course of several weeks that can add up to a pretty significant second harvest. So if you're growing a variety that does give you the side shoots, you don't want to pull out your broccoli once you harvest the main head. And in my case, once I harvest the main head, I give it another dose of that fish fertilizer. I think that really helps the side shoots to really develop fully and to help your broccoli yield the most that it can for you. Now, if you're growing a variety that does not make side shoots, you want to pull that out once you harvest the main head and then you can use that space for something else. So most of the broccoli that I'm growing here is the Eastern Magic variety and that variety does make side shoots. So once I harvest these main heads that are growing here, 
I will give this some more fertilizer and then let it keep going. I do have a couple broccolis on the end here. These are Romanesco. Sometimes you'll see these listed as broccoli, sometimes cauliflower. I don't see any sign of a head forming with those yet. So this is my first year actually growing Romanesco, but according to everything that I've read, it sounds like once you get the main head, you're not gonna get any side shoots from that variety, which makes sense because sometimes it's called a cauliflower and cauliflower is kind of a one and done. Cauliflower doesn't really make side shoots. So once those Romanesco broccolis yield for me, I will pull those out and give that space to something else. Now, those I think are a little bit later of a maturing variety and I don't see any sign of a broccoli head with those yet, even though the plants are really huge. I think they're even bigger than my Eastern Magic broccoli plants. But it's just good to be aware of what variety you're growing so you know exactly how to treat it. Now here at the end of the broccoli bed, you can see this, actually this little edge of the bed is one of my favorite parts of the garden right now. I put those little sweet alyssum plants at the edge of the bed for a couple reasons. One is that they're just really pretty. They add a nice little pop of color. They're early blooming. Then they usually take a little bit of a break from blooming in the summer months when it gets too hot for them, but then they'll bloom again in the fall, which would be really nice. But the most important reason that I put them here is because they're going to basically provide a living mulch for my cucumbers. You can see I just transplanted out my cucumber plants here. They don't look super happy right now, but after a couple days, they should perk up really well. And these alyssum plants right here should basically fill out and cover most of this edge of the bed here. And that will do a couple things. Most importantly, that will cover the soil and prevent moisture evaporation. Cucumbers really do need a significant amount of water. And by not allowing the soil to dry out, that'll cut down on the amount of watering that I have to do and that'll make for healthier and tastier cucumbers. Those alyssum will also help prevent weed growth. They will also help attract pollinators and other beneficial insects. So it's an all around great plant to have. Now you can see I also have a few nasturtiums in there too. Those will have a lot of the same benefits. And I have a little chamomile plant, which is just getting ready to flower. So I'll get to harvest some delicious chamomile tea. Now on the other side of the trellis here, you can see I have basically mirrored that first side. I've got some alyssum, some nasturtium here. Now these, are a little bit farther behind because I didn't plant these quite as early, but they should catch up and be beautiful really soon. Then behind the trellis, you can see again, more cucumbers that I've transplanted out here. Again, they're sulking a little bit. Cucumbers really don't like the roots disturbed, but they should perk up and be do really well in no time. Then I've got a little cosmos here. So I actually prefer to direct sow my cucumbers, but if you've been following along with me, you know that I've had issues the past couple of years with some little pest just nipping the tops off my cucumber seedlings right when they germinate. And for some reason, they do better when I start them on my deck and transplant them out. So while it is easier, and I think it's easier on the cucumber plant too, to be direct sown just to put the seed where it's going to grow its whole life, I find that for the sake of actually getting some cucumbers, I have been needing to start them on my deck and then transplant them out to the garden. So I did do a little experiment and I direct sowed some cucumbers out here just to see what would happen. And as you can see, the top's been nip nipped off that one. I had some of them I experimented with. See, this one actually made it. I kind of covered up the seedling with straw in hopes that whatever pest wouldn't find it. So that one seems to be doing okay. So I'm going to cover that back up. And hopefully, hopefully having that one under straw for a couple days will allow it to get strong enough to be able to withstand whatever pest has been plaguing my cucumbers. I did direct sow some silver slicer cucumbers, which is I think probably my favorite kind of cucumber, along this trellis here. For some reason I was having trouble with my silver slicers germinating on my deck. I only, I planted a bunch of them and I only got one to germinate. So the ones that I sowed out, that I direct sowed here are silver slicers. So I want to try to protect them if I can. I put, I think, four or five seeds down here, and that's the only one that has not been eaten. So I'm gonna to try to protect that as well as I can. Now also in this bed here, you can see I have some zucchinis that came up. I do need to thin at least one of these out, which is kind of hard to do since they look so beautiful and healthy. But I planted three in case they didn't all germinate. I've got a zinnia here, another zinnia, got some nasturtium, cosmos, and then there's another cucumber variety down there. Looks like something's been nibbling at that one a little bit. Now you can see that I did mulch this bed here. I came out and I mulched as much of the garden as I could get to with straw. And I did just put out a whole video dedicated to mulch, so I'm not gonna go into all the detail 
in that in this video, but I'll link the mulch video below in case you're interested in it. But I do find overall that mulch really helps my plants do a lot better, so I wanted to make it a priority to come out and get these mulched. Now on the other half of the trellis here, you can see I have a few tomatoes planted, and then a few more flowers and herbs on the end of the bed there. So coming down here, isn't this variegated nasturtium beautiful? This is the Alaska Red Shades nasturtium, and even though it's not flowering yet, I think those variegated leaves just make it really pretty. So yet another zucchini variety, and I think that's a little nasturtium there. But you can see something's been nibbling on my zucchinis too. But here's a better look at those tomatoes. You can see I've got some zinnias and calendula. Here's some purple bush beans. And yet another zucchini variety, plus some more nasturtium and zinnias. So moving on to this bed here, you can see I've got some white alyssum on the edges of the bed here, and a few nasturtiums coming up. And all the pole beans that I planted are just starting to come up now, which is really exciting. I can't wait for those. I really can't wait for these trellises to be covered. So you can see right now, they're pretty bare. And having those covered just makes the garden really magical and beautiful. All right, so let's head down this bed here. You can see that my peppers are in. Now I was a little concerned about some of my peppers you can see some of the lower leaves there kind of shriveled up and died and I wasn't really sure if that was something I should be concerned about or not I was a little bit afraid that it was some sort of leaf disease but I decided to take the wait-and-see approach because I didn't really know what to do about it without knowing what it was I'm still not 100% sure but it seems like the leaves that were affected have completely shriveled up but I haven't seen it spread to any new leaves which makes me think it's probably something more environmental like maybe transplant shock or sun scald or something like that that affected those individual leaves but probably isn't affecting the whole plant and I'm hoping that's what it is as I said I haven't seen any signs of it spreading so that's a good thing so I didn't have the greatest success with peppers last year so I'm really hoping for a good pepper year this year so you can see I've got quite a few pepper plants in this bed now you can see I did space these fairly closely quite a bit closer than I would space my tomato plants now there's a garden saying that says that peppers like to hold hands and basically the meaning of that is that you want to plant your pepper plants close enough together that when they get mature, their leaves will be basically just lightly touching each other. I'm not sure the exact reason why that's so successful for pepper plants, but I think it has to do with them shading out the ground. When they grow that close together, they basically shade the ground. It protects the pepper fruits from sun scald, and it protects the soil from moisture evaporation. Now you can see I did have these pepper plants mulched with straw, which will also protect the soil from evaporation as well. So whatever the reason for the saying, I always appreciate when plants like to be planted close together because then I can get more plants in a smaller space. So this is the back of the bed. See all the peppers are in the front there. And here in the back, I have these tomato plants. So I did space these slightly closer than is probably ideal. But I've experimented with different spacing. And in my personal experience, spacing them farther apart didn't really reduce disease. Usually when people spread them farther apart, it's to create better airflow to reduce tomato plant disease. And depending on your environment, you may need to space them a different spacing than I use. So you can see in the front of the tomato plants, I've got a variety of other things growing. We've got some basil, calendula, some marigolds. I'm experimenting this year with growing zucchini in the same bed. The idea is that it should get big and really shade out a lot of that soil and prevent weeds and other things like that. More marigolds. And then there's another little zucchini that just germinated. So across the aisle from the tomato bed is my lettuce bed. You can see this isn't looking quite as lush as it was. We've been harvesting a lot of lettuce. Now you can see with this, this is butter crunch. You can see that we cut off the original plant that came up and now it's sending up new leaves. Now when you harvest your plant, if you leave a few inches behind, so what I do is I come out here with scissors. I'll just cut the whole plant off, but I leave a couple inches behind. And that's called the cut and come again method of harvesting. Basically what happens is by leaving a few inches behind, you're giving your plant enough energy remaining that it can regrow a second set of leaves. And in some cases, it'll even grow a third set of leaves. So we've come through, we've harvested all these plants, and you can see that they're now regrowing. So we'll just come through and keep harvesting these until they either stop growing or until it gets too hot for them and they bolt. As you can see, there's a pretty big variety of lettuces here. We've been harvesting all of these. 
This one's doing really well. This is Marvel of Four Seasons. And you can see here, I just cut this head for the second time, actually. These in the back have all been harvested once, and they're ready to be harvested again. So we'll see. This may... I'm guessing this will probably regrow a third time with how vigorous this plant is. Now that we're into June, though, and getting into summer, it won't be too long before all of this lettuce bolts and goes to seed, and then I won't have any more harvest from this bed here. Now, if you noticed, I forgot to point it out, but when we looked at the broccoli bed before, you probably saw that I had a pretty thick carpet of lettuce growing underneath the broccoli. That lettuce was planted several weeks after the lettuce here in this bed. So once we're done harvesting the lettuce in this bed, we're going to move over and start harvesting the lettuce in the broccoli bed. And I did just sow some seeds in another section for a third crop of lettuce. I'm not sure if they've germinated yet, but we'll check on that when we get to that section of the garden. So let's cross the walkway here. and We'll go over to the second tomato bed. Now, I have to come out here and do some pretty serious maintenance on these tomato plants. So here in Connecticut, the past few days, we've been really heavily affected by a lot of smoke from those wildfires that are burning up in Canada. The air quality has not been that great. Now, we haven't been hit as hard as some places. Like, I know New York was really bad for a while, and parts of Pennsylvania were really, really smoky. But we did still have serious enough smoke that they were recommending people staying inside. The air quality was listed as unhealthy. So, while I did come out to the garden a little bit, I didn't want to spend a lot of time out here in that smoky environment. And so, because of that, I just did the absolutely necessary tasks, and I kind of let my tomatoes go a little bit. So they need to be pruned, they need to be tied up a little bit. So there's definitely some work to do now that our air is really clearing up here. So you can see, again, I'm growing some zucchinis over in this tomato bed too, continuing my experiment. Got some spicy globe basil here, nasturtiums. So this, I, I don't know if you can even see that down there. Those, I believe, are little borage plants. Chamomile, marigolds. Got another variety of zucchinis here. Lots more basil, marigolds, cosmos, zinnias. So I like to do my best to create a garden that is not just productive, but also beautiful. And planting a lot of variety and a lot of companion plants, mixing a lot of flowers and herbs in along with my main crops, I feel like it's a big part of that. And in addition to just being beautiful, creating that biodiversity in the garden there will make for a healthier garden overall. It'll make for more resistance to pests, it'll make for better pollination, and just overall, it'll be a more successful garden. So over here you can see my cherry tomato plants. And there is actually a really big difference in growth in these plants. You can see these three plants in a row right here are looking really big and healthy. By comparison, these here, while they still look pretty healthy, they almost look stunted. And then that one on the end is also really large. Now I took a little bit of a risk this year, which in this case seems to have paid off. It would not always pay off. But I planted a few of my tomato plants a little bit early. So it really did seem like we're past the last frost for our area. We did end up getting a late frost. But the tomato plants that I planted out early, I was able to protect and get them through that frost. And they were probably planted about two weeks earlier than my other tomato plants that are right next to them. And you can see those extra two weeks in the ground really resulted in faster growth. They look really big and healthy, and I'm really excited to hopefully get a little bit of an early yield from those cherry tomatoes. So I'm looking at some of these flower clusters and thinking it won't be too long before we actually get cherry tomatoes. Of course, it's going to feel like a long wait, but it'll be worth it. So I've got a really big variety of cherry tomatoes planted in this bed here. I've got a few of my tried and true favorites. You know, sun gold I love. I have to grow every year. Matt's Wild Cherry is a delicious red tomato. I've got black cherry, which is really good too. It's got a little bit of a deeper flavor, and that's my husband and my son's favorite. Plus, I've got some new varieties that I'm really excited to try. I've got Barry's Crazy Cherry, which is supposed to be a pale yellow that yields a lot of fruit, very sweet. So I'm really excited for that. I'm trying red centiflor because I did want to try another red cherry tomato and that one is supposed to be really delicious and have a really good yield. I'm excited for that. I've also got rosella which is another sort of smoky purple tomato. So I there's just going to be so much deliciousness this summer that I just can't wait to try it. Now you can see some of the companion plants I planted in this bed are not doing that well. Something's been eating my basil. It doesn't look very good. And again, this basil, this one may just be a little bit of transplant shock. Got some marigolds, 
another basil. That one looks small, but actually looks okay. Now this bed back here, you can see my parsley and dill are both looking pretty good. Chamomile is getting ready to hopefully flower really soon. I think this part looks like it's probably going to flower really soon. Now back here in this kind of bare area here, I planted a bunch of lettuce seeds. So I mentioned before when we were over at the lettuce patch that I had planted more lettuce seeds to hopefully get a third wave of lettuce. And that is what is hopefully going to be happening in this bed here. This little bed is in the back corner of the garden and gets quite a bit of shade, more shade than is really ideal for a vegetable garden. But I'm hoping that that shade will work in my favor when it comes to lettuce and give me a little bit of a later crop of lettuce that hopefully won't bolt as early as my other lettuce. So we're gonna see what happens with those seeds there. And actually, I was gonna say I don't see any sign of germination, but when you look close, there actually are tiny little lettuce seedlings that have germinated. So hopefully this will be successful. I find that later planted lettuce doesn't usually do as well for me in the garden, but every year I give it a try anyway, and usually I get at least a limited amount of success. Now this last bed here, you can see I have this one growing under netting as well, just like my broccoli. So that really will protect this from pests like cabbage worms. So here's our mixed kale and cabbage and cauliflower bed. So you can see the kale is looking pretty good. Got some nice healthy leaves here. And it looks like we've got three varieties growing successfully. I've got red Russian kale. This is blue curled scotch, kind of the classic kale. Here I've got dazzling blue lacinato kale. You can see that one makes a really nice contrast. And I planted scarlet kale as well, but I don't think any of that actually made it. That one always seems a little bit more finicky than the other varieties. Here I've got my cabbage, but I am a little worried that some of this cabbage is going to bolt and not make a head. So we're gonna see what happens. And here I've got my Savoy cabbage. This is early Jersey Wakefield. And this looks like another Savoy. But see this one here, this is another early Jersey Wakefield, and this one to me looks like it's bolting instead of making a head. So we'll see what happens with the others. So this is actually, this isn't bolted, well it is bolted kale, but this is kale from last summer. So it's expected that that one would bolt. And hopefully that'll make some seeds for us. We'll see if any of those seeds actually develop. Down here is my huge carrot plant. This is from last year that overwintered and is now making lots of flowers. So carrots are a biennial plant. Basically what that means is that it takes two years to complete their life cycle. So if you're growing carrots for the carrot root, you would harvest them the first year. So they'll go through, they'll get nice foliage, they'll make their root, they'll send all that nutrients down to the root, and that's when you want to harvest the root. Because the second year, it takes those nutrients out of the root and sends them up to make flowers and seeds. And at that point, the root becomes kind of spongy and not really as delicious. But as you can see, that carrot plant has gotten really huge its second year. And that should make a lot of seeds for me. So I'm just letting it go. I think the pollinators will be really happy to see it. And that should make a lot of delicious carrot seeds that will make lots of carrots for us in the future, hopefully. It's just crazy to see how big the plants get the second year. If you're familiar with Queen Anne's lace at all, you probably notice that this plant looks almost identical. Queen Anne's lace is also in the same family as carrot and sometimes it's referred to as wild carrot. So they're actually really similar plants. Now you'll probably notice when I recovered this kale bed, I left this carrot exposed. I want this to be out of the netting because I want pollinators to be able to reach this so that this gets pollinated and can set its seeds. So that's about all that's going on in this main garden here. We're gonna head over across the yard and we're gonna go take a look at the garden expansion because there's lots of updates and lots of things growing over there too. So this garden's really coming along here. So this bed here, you can see I've got four tomatoes in it. And while it is not ideal to support tomatoes, or at least indeterminate tomatoes in tomato cages, that's what I had available at the moment. My plan is for this not to be a tomato bed long term, just for this season. Basically, I have another bed of strawberries in this garden, and my plan is when those strawberries put out runners, I'm going to take those runners and add a second strawberry bed in this bed here. But since I didn't have the runners yet, I did not want to let this bed sit empty. So I put tomatoes in it. Because it's not going to be a long-term tomato bed, I didn't want to install a trellis here. 
and I think for one season the tomato cages won't be ideal but these tomatoes will get by and we'll still get some kind of yield from them. Now I've got different types of basil growing in front of this bed. So you can see some of these basils aren't transplanting the best, but I've got a purple ball basil, a mammoth basil there. Here's a spicy globe basil, another mammoth basil, and here I've just got a classic Genevieve sweet basil, and a tiny little mammoth basil, which hopefully will eventually live up to its name. But then I've got a variety of flowers mixed in as well. On this trellis here, you can see on the other side of the trellis is the asparagus patch. But on the trellis here, I've planted melons on both sides of it. So those melon seeds have not come up and germinated yet, but I have planted Minnesota midget, which is basically like a mini personalized or personal sized cantaloupe. And I've also planted Kajari melon, which is also a personal sized melon. So I'm hoping that those two will be successful. I've never successfully grown either of those, but I'm hoping for success this year because I think those will make nice, refreshing, delicious snacks to have in the summer. Now, my fencing here is almost invisible. Um, I don't even know if I can get the camera to focus on it. So I've got, you can see fishing line here. Basically, I put these T-posts surrounding the garden. And the main purpose of this fence is to keep out deer. So I don't have any experience using fishing line as a fence. But if you do, I would love to hear your experience and how successful that was at keeping out deer. Basically, what I've heard is that... The deer can't see the fishing line, so they try to come through, and when they run into the fishing line, they feel it and it confuses them because they can't see it, which in theory keeps them away. So if you have tried that either successfully or unsuccessfully, I would love to hear about your experience because I don't really want to invest in a full-blown fence at the moment for this garden, so I'm hoping that the fishing line will be enough to do the trick. So definitely let me know if you have any experience with that. And this bed is the most recent bed to get planted out here. These are my sweet potatoes. You can see that they're overall healthy, but they're not super happy about being transplanted out here. So I just planted these out here a few days ago. Basically, I think it was the day before all that smoke kind of overtook our Connecticut air. And so they've only been out here for a few days. I did water them when I first planted them in. And then, as I said, I haven't spent a lot of time outside since then. So I'm hoping that they will take off and do really well. So I grew sweet potatoes last year kind of on a whim. I had a few sweet potato slips and so I decided why not plant them. So I just put them in pots on my deck and I was actually pleasantly surprised with how well they did. I figured being in Connecticut, you know, we're not a warm southern state, not really known for sweet potato growing. So I wasn't sure how successful they'd be, but they actually did really well. So this year I have devoted an entire eight by four foot bed to them and we're gonna see how they do. So definitely stay tuned, probably sometime in maybe September or October, I'll be harvesting those and I'm hoping to be pleasantly surprised again. We'll see how the season goes. Now on the end of the sweet potato bed here, along this trellis, I've planted noodle beans. Now you can see on this side of the trellis, I had really poor germination. You can see three came up. I had much better germination on the other side, but I did replant and I'm hoping that we'll get better germination with the second planting. So I'll definitely be keeping an eye on those. So noodle beans are a completely new crop to me. I've never grown them before and I don't really know anything about growing them or anything about eating them either. So if you have any experience with those, please go ahead and share your wisdom with that too. I mainly have decided to grow them because I've seen so many other people growing them and they look so beautiful on a trellis. So just the thought of just having that beauty in my garden convinced me to give them a try. And I'm sure I'll find something delicious to do with them too. So I'm hoping that they'll be successful and then hopefully this whole trellis will be covered with them this summer. So you can see something has been nibbling at my noodle beans over here, but I did have better germination. This one's actually a bush bean that I forgot I had planted there until it popped up. But along the trellis here, I have quite a few more than on the other side. Now this bed here is primarily my strawberry bed. And as you can see, they are flowering, which is kind of controversial when it comes to just planted strawberries. So when you plant new strawberries, I think they say you're supposed to pick all the blooms off for at least the first six weeks after they've been planted. And these, I want to say it's been about five weeks since they've been planted now. They are blooming. So technically I should be picking these blooms off. I honestly, I started out with the greatest intentions of picking all the strawberry blooms off 
and everything kind of got away from me. We went camping for a weekend and then we had that smoky air quality. So I kind of got caught up in stuff and let a lot of the blooms go. So at this point, I've kind of decided we're gonna let at least a few of them bloom. We're gonna see how they do. Hopefully we like the strawberry variety because I've never grown it before. So I'm hoping it will be good. And my plan is eventually to take runners from this bed, fill the other bed, and I think that eventually we will have a great strawberry harvest. I'm just hoping that letting a few of these plants bloom doesn't set us back too much in that ultimate goal, but we're just gonna give it a try and we're gonna see what happens with these strawberries. So over here is my potato bed. You can see these are looking really abundant and these are probably the happiest looking thing in my garden right now. I gotta say, I was a little worried about these potatoes because they don't actually get as much sun as would be ideal for potato plants. So these are actually in filtered sunlight the majority of the day with only a short time of actual direct sun. So I'm not sure how that will translate to a potato harvest. Honestly, when I planted this bed, I thought that it got slightly more sun than it did, but once all the trees leafed out, I realized that it was a little shadier than I had thought. So I'm hoping that these potatoes are successful here. If they aren't successful, then next year I'll probably use this bed for something that can tolerate a little more shade, like maybe lettuce or some kind of greens. But we'll see how these potatoes do. And based on the foliage, I'm saying that they wanna grow and hopefully we'll get a good potato yield despite them getting a little bit of shade. So I've got red okay. potatoes down at this end of the bed. I think this bed is about two thirds to three quarters red potatoes. And then at the end, I've got some smaller plants here. Those are gold potatoes. So hopefully we'll get a good harvest of both. Now on the trellis here, I've planted some winter squash. Let me see. I don't see any signs of these coming up here. Over here, you can see this one's germinated and I don't know if you can really see it on the camera. There's a second one down in there that germinated too. I don't know if you can really see it. So those two that have germinated are both butternut squash. And I also planted a couple seeds for honey nut squash on the other end. I have not seen any signs of germination in those. In fact, I've planted honey nut squash a few places in my garden and I haven't seen any germination. So what I ended up, okay then, <laughs> I guess my chickens have some opinions about that honey nut squash not germinating. So what I ended up doing was taking some seeds in my house and putting them in a Ziploc baggie in a moist paper towel. And I'm hoping that I can get some to germinate that way and then transplant them out to the garden. So I'll keep you posted on what happens with those. But honey nut squash, I've never actually tried it before, but it was very highly recommended to me by a friend. So I wanted to give it a try this year. So I'm going to do my best to get some of those seeds to germinate so I can give it a try. Basically a honey nut squash is like a mini, I guess personal size version of a butternut squash. But supposedly the flavor is sweeter and I've never tried it before. So again, if you've tried butter, if you tried both butternut squash and honey nut squash, I am curious to hear how they compare. So I did plant those same squashes on this side of the trellis here. Down here was a butternut and something ate the top off of that, just like it ate the top off my cucumbers. And there is actually right here, I don't know if you can even really see it, another one just starting. That would be a butternut squash as well. But along this trellis, I don't see any sign of honey nut squash either. So this trellis ended up being a little bit of a hodgepodge this year. And you can see there's actually a fair amount of chickweed, which is growing wild, and I'm just letting that grow. It makes a great living mulch. It's delicious to eat, and my chickens like it too. So not a bad plant to have growing. Over here, I did have a sun gold tomato, which did not make it, very surprising to me. So I planted a little bit, a little shoot from my stapichka tomato there, and I'm hoping that that will take off and take its place. You can see I've got some carrots, some Swiss chard. Over here, I've got some chamomile that's just about to bloom. So again, a little bit of delicious chamomile tea. I've got onions along the edges, some nasturtiums, calendula. This bed, like I said, has a little bit of everything. There, I've got another cherry tomato. As you can see, that one looks a little bit, it's got a little bit of sun scald or something like that going on, but except for that, it actually looks pretty healthy. Over here on the corner, I have some sugar pie pumpkins. And over here, some sugar pie pumpkins that germinated actually a couple days ago. You can see I have them planted in the very corner of the bed. So the winter squash family, which pumpkins are a member of, tends to take up a lot of space. They just kind of sprawl out and just take up a lot of space. 
So the idea with putting the pumpkins there in the corner of the bed was that I'm going to try to control the sprawl and get them to sprawl in the walkways so that all that space that they take up will be walkway space rather than taking up a lot of growing space in the bed itself. So that hopefully in theory, I should still be able to grow lots of other things in this bed. Now kind of along the same idea, the butternut squash and the honey nut squash that I planted along that trellis, the idea is that they're going to climb up that trellis. I may need to give them a little help climbing the trellis. But if they climb up the trellis, again, they'll be taking up vertical space, they'll be taking up walkway space, and hopefully not taking up as much growing space in my garden. You can see my little pots here. I just put here as a little touch of color and prettiness in this garden. And this here is a corbacci pepper, which hopefully will perk up and do a little bit better soon. And then, oh, it looks like it germinated. Back here in the back of this pot, I planted a dwarf sunflower. I figured that would be a good combination with these plants here. And then over here, I've got my blackberries. Now, before we really start looking at that blackberry bed, I have to share a sad story. Now, I have been having so much trouble with cucumbers the past couple years. It's kind of crazy because cucumbers are really not that difficult to grow. So, I've been telling you what's been happening with my cucumbers that I direct sow. Something comes along and eats the top off them as soon as they germinate. So, you know, I've been starting cucumbers in pots on my deck. That way they're already acclimated to the sunshine and the weather, and all I have to do is put them into their spot in the ground. So that's been working really well. You saw the ones that I had out in the garden. Now last year, I did that and I ended up with extra cucumber plants. So I ended up growing them along this chain link fence that I have here, and they did really well there. I was very pleasantly surprised. So of course I said, well, I can get more cucumber plants there. Why don't I grow extra on purpose this year? So I did that. So along this fence here, kind of in between my blackberry plants, I have six cucumber plants that I planted. And then by the front part of the fence, kind of near my lemon balm, I had another five cucumber plants that I planted. So I planted them, they looked great. The next day I came out and all of the cucumbers were dug up. Nothing had eaten them, just dug them up and put them on the ground. I have no idea what the reasoning was for digging them up. I don't know if it was just because I had just freshly turned some, some of that soil and they were like, ooh, fresh soil to play in. I don't know. So all the cucumbers were dug up and just put to the side. So I replanted them all, but cucumbers do not like their roots messed with. That's why I usually try to direct sow them if I can. They don't really like to have their roots messed with. So I am not sure if they're gonna make it. I don't know if they do make it. I don't know if they're gonna struggle because being dug up rudely like that and having the roots completely exposed was not really in their ideal life plan. So we're gonna see what happens with them. And hopefully at some point this year, I will actually get to harvest some cucumbers. So we'll see what happens with that. See, you can see I replanted these cucumbers. This one actually looks like it would be okay if something hadn't been nibbling it. This one here feels really limp and weak, so I don't know. I'm not sure if these are going to make it or not. This one probably will as long as it can withstand this pest damage. I don't know about this one though. So over here, I'm not sure what's going to happen with these. Very upsetting. And then you can see these looked beautiful and healthy when I pulled oh, something ripped the top off this one completely. I don't know what kind of pest that is. These looked beautiful and healthy when I planted them a couple days ago. So on the bright side over here, let's appreciate the blackberry bushes. These are still really small, which is why I figured I could get away with planting cucumbers with them this year. But within a year or two, these will be nice and big. So over here, these are also cucumbers that I replanted. These actually look much better. So I'm thinking that these have a better chance of survival. So, you know, actually I misspoke. These little ones were not actually dug up. These were just covered with soil from, being, from the other ones being dug up. So. We'll see what happens here. Over here, you can see my nice lemon balm plant, which I'm hoping eventually will spread and take over this whole area so I can harvest lots of lemon balm for tea. But in the meantime, I'm using this for cucumbers. So thank you so much for hanging out with me in the garden today. I hope that you enjoyed this little walk through my early June garden. I know I'm really enjoying watching the garden grow. Even with those inevitable failures, it seems like the garden always tends to be more successful than not. So I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for the resilience of plants. So I will definitely keep you posted on how those cucumbers do, on how everything else in the garden is growing, and I hope that you join me again and see my garden again in a couple weeks. I hope you're having a great day, and I'll see you soon. I'll see you next time.